Well, according to the clock on my computer, it is one minute after 10. So I am going to begin. I see a number of people saying hello in the chat room. And hello to you all. And welcome to the May Ormond Beach Historical Society Speaker Series, sponsored by a matching grant from the Florida Humanities Council. And we want to welcome you to our first ever online presentation. And I also want to apologize if you got five or six reminder emails yesterday. It's been a bit of a challenge to learn this new technology and that was definitely my operator error. So I apologize. We really appreciate everyone's patience as we figure this out together. And I also want to thank our speaker, Mike Tugas, for agreeing to try this out with us from his home in Massachusetts. And I'm indebted to Alex Buell with the Florida Humanities Council. I never could have figured this out without him. Let me explain uh, this time how a couple of things are going to work. As soon as I'm finished with this introduction, Michael will take over and you'll be able to see him and also his slides, which you should be able to see now on the, pic on the uh, screen. If my picture is covering up part of the slides, look at the icons at the bottom of my picture. The one on the far right side, it's a little box with another little box and an arrow. If you click on that icon on the far right hand side, the little box, if you click on that, it'll move the picture of the presenter over to the right hand side of the screen and not on top of the slides. We are going to have a question and answer session after the presentation. So we would appreciate it if you hold your questions until afterwards. And then you can type your questions. They'll show up on the chat box on the right side. I will read them and Michael will answer them. Also, after the presentation, you'll see a survey or questionnaire that will appear on the screen, assuming I remember to do it. Um, this is the place in place of our normal evaluation forms that we use. It's really important that we give feedback to the Florida Humanities. It's part of our grant requirements. It's only a three question survey and two of them are multiple choice. So please take a couple of minutes at the end to fill in the survey. Also at the top of the screen, you'll see a tiny little box that says donate. That's in lieu of our usual physical donation boxes. So if you're able to help the society support these programs, please click on that box to donate or go to our website, www.ormanhistory.org and click on donate there. So again, we wanna thank everyone for participating and giving this a try. We have two more online programs scheduled for the remainder of this season. On June the 13th is the program that was originally scheduled for April. That was entitled Privateers of the Americas. And then on June the 27th, we will have Florida's female pioneers. Uh, that's the date that that was originally scheduled. You can register for both of these on our website. Again, you know what that is, ormanhistory.org. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Many of you have heard Michael last year uh, when he spoke to us. And so we welcome him back. Michael J. Tugas is a New York Times bestselling author and co-author of 30 books. He is best known for his seven survival at sea books, such as A Storm Too Soon, So Close to Home, and The Finest Hours, that has been made into a major motion picture by Disney. His book, 10 Hours Until Dawn, the True Story of Heroism and Tragedy Aboard the Can Do in the Blizzard of 78 was selected by the American Library Association as one of the top books of the year and described as a white knuckle read, the best of its kind. His latest co-written book about the Cuban Missile Crisis is the topic of today's talk. All Michael book, Michael's books are available at Amazon. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Vonda. Good morning, everyone. The, um, the way I've got today's lecture structured is it uh, will feel a little bit like you're watching a, a documentary with me 
narrating and telling you a little bit about the research. But uh, my main hope is that you have four or five surprises that you never knew occurred during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, earlier, Bonda and I were talking and I was saying, it's strange to do these online events because you, you can't see your audience and you're wondering, is everybody still there? But I did this program um, two weeks ago and um, one of the main characters you're gonna meet in this story was online watching and I didn't know. So I'm glad I gave it my all and uh, got things uh, accurately because you'll meet him. His name is uh, Jerry McElmoyle. I dedicated the book to him and others. And um, I, it's just a strange thing. I had no idea he was in the audience. And at the end, I just said, boy, had I known you were in the audience, it would have made me nervous because you were there and I wasn't. So anyways, we're going to get started. And this slide that you see here of the U-2 spy plane is uh, at the center of the Cuban Missile Crisis story and above and beyond. These are amazing aircrafts that could fly 13 miles above the Earth. And uh, if, if you were a pilot, you had to wear a uh, pressure suit. And you see uh, one in this photo, and they have the the uh, astronaut style helmet. And the reason for that is if the cabin of the aircraft loses its air pressure, this will keep you alive. This will mimic the air pressure on earth. Uh, without this, you'd be dead within 30 to 60 seconds. And by the way, this, this gentleman you see in the pressure suit, he was the, um, he was the pilot who actually discovered the missiles in Cuba and um, he uh, is from Florida or was from Florida, Apalachicola. So in this story, there are a lot of connections to Florida. And this gentleman's name is Steve Heiser. I worked a little bit with his son during the research. But boy, the stakes couldn't be higher during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it, it kind of puts the pandemic that we're going through in perspective that we've had some rough times in the past. And um, thank God we had uh, two relatively level-headed leaders in Khrushchev and Kennedy. So a little bit of the background before the Cuban Missile Crisis, you have Castro overthrowing Batista in 1959. Then our failed Bay of Pigs efforts that we backed, you know, it's, it's interesting as a uh, historian, I like to look at things in a different way. And I actually think that might have been a blessing in disguise because it happened during President Kennedy's uh, watch and he learned so much from the mistakes he made. And he was able to apply some of what he learned to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I've often wondered without the Bay of Pigs, would he have reacted differently? And, and my personal thought is yes. Um, that the Bay of Pigs taught him some valuable lessons, uh, one of which is not to be rushed. And the second one was to ask a lot of questions from people with opposing viewpoints. So after the Bay of Pigs, uh, the Soviets began their military buildup in Cuba, which we knew about. Uh, the one thing we didn't know about was that they had offensive weapons there, and we certainly didn't know about the nuclear missiles, but we were monitoring the, the buildup. And it wasn't until October 14th that Steve Heiser got the first photographs showing that there were nuclear missiles in Cuba. And that, of course, precipitated this, this crisis of 13 days and everything changed because of his, his photos. Part of the reason we didn't know prior to the photos is we were not allowing our U-2s to do overflights of Cuba. We were having them fly along the periphery because I'll bet most of you remember Gary Powers was shot down over Russia in 1960. And that happened during the Eisenhower administration. And Eisenhower had been told, if one of our U-2s is shot down, uh, there's no way that the pilot could ever survive. And then uh, he was in for the shock of his life when the Soviets trotted out Gary Powers. He somehow ejected out 
of the aircraft and, and survive that 13 mile plunge. You know, my opinion of Khrushchev before I started this research was that he was kind of this mercurial man, maybe a little off balance. I remember the banging of the shoe on the podium, but I had the good luck to track down his son, Sergei, who ironically is, is living in Rhode Island, Massachusetts. And Sergei said that he was old enough during the Cuban Missile Crisis to have conversations with his father about what was happening. So some of that I, I relay in Above and Beyond. And one thing that stuck with me was Sergei explained that his father's primary fear was that somebody on the ground in Cuba would have a different agenda than, than him and that, that he, Khrushchev, would lose control of this whole event. And I said, that's, that's pretty strange that you said that because JFK said the exact same thing almost to Bobby. He said, my big concern is miscalculations. Somebody does something without my authorization. And the next thing you know, I've lost control of this, this whole crisis. So they, they both had the same concerns. Kennedy recognized that it wasn't, the missiles in Cuba weren't just a military threat to the US. They could reach Washington DC in approximately 10 minutes, but he saw it as a, as a political threat. He said to Bobby, if I don't get those missiles out of there, I'll be impeached. And I believe he was correct on that. The, the American public would have never stood for having missiles just 90 miles away. But from the Russian perspective, we had missiles all over Europe. We had them in Turkey, in the United Kingdom, uh, in the Mediterranean, on our subs. So I remember in one of my interviews with uh, Khrushchev's son, his father had said, well, now the Americans will know what it feels like to have missiles on their doorstep. I learned a lot about Cuba. I did not know how big the island was, uh, over 700 miles long. Never knew where the Bay of Pigs was and where our Guantanamo Bay was. So I, I was writing this book for the general public, not just the real uh, history buff, because I was learning as I went. And I'll explain later a couple inside scoops that I had, but a lot of the CIA documents that I used were just recently declassified in the last eight to nine years. So there was some new information that came, came to light. So I wanna switch gears now and introduce you to the four or five main characters of the story. Uh, this is Jerry McElmoyle. He was one of the U-2 pilots and Jerry was the, the youngest of the group, only 32 years old. And um, <clears throat> when I said, when I was doing the program the other day and someone was watching, it was Jerry who is now uh, 90 years old in great shape and um, worked with me every step of the way on the book. But back during the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was one of these elite pilots selected by the military to make the overflights of Cuba in the U-2. There were, were 10 of those pilots selected and they were actually all brought to Orlando, Florida and to McCoy Airfield uh, because of its close proximity to Cuba. Another character you're going to meet in the program today and in the book was Jerry's boss, Major Rudy Anderson. Interesting person to research, even though he was quite a pilot and flew fighter jets. He was really a pacifist. He did not want to kill anybody. So he was always volunteering to do missions where uh, it was reconnaissance. So uh, he flew during the Korean War, but mostly on reconnaissance missions. Another one of the pilots was Chuck Maltzby. He was a fighter pilot during the Korean War, was shot down, held by the Chinese. And he said that he was held in a four foot by five foot earthen cave for three years, uh, just horrid conditions. And I was shocked that when he was finally released in the POW exchange, that uh, 
he re-upped in the military. Um, I would have never set foot in an aircraft again, but um, he became a Thunderbird pilot. Uh, the CIA recognized his skills, so they recruited him for the U-2 program. And so you'll see how Chuck's uh, involvement played out. And then finally, President Kennedy, I thought, well, yes, he's going to be a character in the book, but I like to focus on these daring missions of the pilots. But in the research, I realized Kennedy secretly audio taped every conversation he had on the Cuban Missile Crisis. So you had over 100 hours of audio tape, which was converted into a book, which I was able to refer to at any time during the research. And so in Above and Beyond, oftentimes I'll put in what was happening at Kennedy's meetings, particularly when the tension was really high, when an argument broke out or they were on the cusp of a major decision. Um, but it, it, it gave you insight into the president's mind, how he conducted these meetings. And I, and I will tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. <clears throat> But the crisis begins, of course, when Steve Heiser secures those photos showing the missiles. Uh, this is old fashioned film, so it takes a while to be analyzed. Kennedy was told while he was having breakfast on the 16th of October, um, tough, tough way to wake up in the morning. And I was wondering before I got to that part of the research, you know, what would his question be? Mine would be how many missiles, where are they? Uh, but First he said, are you sure? Because he'd see a photo like this and he'd go, I can't see any missiles. And the photo interpreters who showed him these photos said, Mr. President, back at the lab, we can expand these, enlarge these, enhance these, and we've been doing that. And we all agree what we're looking at are medium range ballistic missiles. And it was interesting, this is part of the CIA's National Photographic Interpretation Center. Uh, they, they hit it above a used car dealership in Washington, DC. But again, everything was uh, old fashioned film, not digital. So it took a good 24 to 36 hours to be uh, delivered and developed. Uh, one of his questions was, when will the missiles be operational? And I thought, what a great question early on, because the answer would define the parameters of how long he had to remove them, because he realized once they've got the warheads on the top and they're ready to be fired, the Soviets have us over a barrel, and it'll be a lot harder to get these missiles out of there. And he was told that the nuclear warheads were not on the missiles that the uh, intelligence uh, community believed they were in Cuba and they were, it did turn out to be true. But he was told about, you have about 10 to 12 days before they're operational. So that was good. That was a good thing because it, it allowed him not to feel too rushed. Uh, he knew that was the outer limits of his timeline for action. Second decision is who's gonna be my core team? And um, he picked people from different departments because of their brain power. And uh, importantly, he did not pick just yes men. He picked people with differing opinions, one of which you're gonna meet in a little bit, Curtis LeMay. Um, he wanted to hear all sides. Uh, the military was unanimous in their vote to immediately bomb Cuba and take out these missile sites. So this is that, that team of advisors meeting in the cabinet room. You see Bobby Kennedy standing up on the left. They did not know that they were being secretly audio recorded. The microphones were over in the, uh, the bookcase. And um, Bobby might have knew because he was by far the president's closest trusted uh, advisor in all things, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. And he, he did play a pivotal role. You see LBJ sitting down in the back. Very interesting, uh, as I listened to some of the audio tapes, he did not say much when Kennedy was in the room, 
But if Kennedy left the room, then he'd pipe up. And I'm not quite sure why. I know there was bad blood between him and Bobby Kennedy, but um, it was just odd the way he usually would speak speak up when the president left the room. So after uh, that first emergency meeting, the president authorizes as many flights over Cuba by our spy planes as possible to find out, well, where are the missiles and how many are there? Is it just this one site outside of Havana or are there more? So the next pilot to fly was uh, Rudy Anderson, as you see in this photo. And when Rudy lands back in Orlando after his mission, he's got more bad news. There are missile sites scattered in the countryside throughout Cuba. And um, we would add to those uh, photos by other flights from those 10 U-2 pilots. The plane was really quite a marvel. Um, amazing that in just three and a half years time, it went from the concept of the plane to its completion and its first trial runs. One thing they learned early on was the wings were so long uh, in excess of 90 feet for the first model, later in excess of 100 feet. They were so long that they would scrape on the ground when the plane was taking off. And their solution was quite simple. Uh, put these pogo sticks underneath the wings but they're not attached to the wings so that as soon as the aircraft is airborne, those just drop away. And then when the aircraft lands, it's used up its fuel so it's lighter and the wings wouldn't scrape the runway. So just a simple solution. I, I like to call the U-2 um, like a big glider on steroids. So, you know, it has a jet engine, but yet everything about it is built to be lightweight. So Orlando offered them close proximity to Cuba, but a key element to all this is the U-2 could only take pictures if the weather was clear. And so in October, you've got a lot of stormy weather. They would, as soon as they had a break in the cloud cover, they would launch and get their photos. So another reason to have the planes in Orlando. Down in uh, Boca Chica, there's an airfield in Key West that's where we had a lot of our uh, fighter jets ready to go if war breaks out. And in fact, they were we had military equipment in every single available space throughout Florida that could accommodate them. I've interviewed a lot of people that remember this, and they recall seeing just convoys come down the roadways of uh, Cuba long before Kennedy announced what was happening. So people in Florida knew something was up but they didn't know exactly what was going on. This uh, slide is interesting because you have Kennedy in his favorite rocking chair. We write about his service in the military in the PT-109, um, which does come into play uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the reason I say that is sometimes if the generals were advocating all out military strikes and how successful they'll be, he would say things, he said this one line three different times. He said, uh, you might feel differently when the blood starts flowing. In other words, you know, he'd been in combat, he'd seen death in combat, and it's easy to talk about this thing. It's a lot harder when it's actually underway in the fog of war, things get out of hand. So in this photo, you have the Soviet foreign minister, the Soviet ambassador, they're talking about Cuba. Kennedy has not tipped his hand that he knows there's nuclear missiles there. Uh, these two Russians tell the president, yes, we have a military buildup in Cuba, but we can assure you there's no nuclear missiles. And as soon as they leave the room, Kennedy turns to Bobby and he goes, I can't believe they lied to me right in the Oval Office. It was all I could do not to go to my desk, take out the photos of the missiles and shove it under their noses. But he couldn't do that because he hasn't decided on his course of action. And again, we're into probably day four or five in the crisis. Most of his advisors are counseling surprise military action, but he keeps saying, I think the Russians will respond and one thing's gonna lead into another and we'll be in World War III. Uh, interestingly though, on the first day of the meeting, 
Kennedy is going along with the generals and he's saying, yep, looks like that's what we're going to do. A complete surprise airstrike, perhaps followed up with a, a D-Day styled invasion. But, but thank God he had that time to work with them. The more he thought about it, the more he realized this may get out of control and lead to nuclear war. So Curtis LeMay is not happy that Kennedy is hesitating um, behind Kennedy's back. He calls him weak. Um, to his face, he'd say things like, you're in a bad fix, Mr. President. And Kennedy goes, what did you just say? And LeMay goes, I said, you're in a bad fix. And Kennedy breaks the tension and he goes, well, you're in it with me. Uh, and he didn't kick LeMay out of the room sometimes when he was borderline insubordinate. Another time LeMay said, oh, you're, what you're doing is worse than the appeasement of Munich. And in defense of LeMay, he's looking at this strictly from a military standpoint saying, we've got the element of surprise right now. They don't know, we know, let's attack. And Kennedy would say, well, don't you think the Russians are gonna respond when we kill Russians on the ground? in Cuba, and LeMay would say, no, we're stronger and they know it. Um, and Kennedy said, well, I disagree. So Kennedy frustrates the generals by choosing a blockade, and some people say that'll never work, and he goes, you're probably right, but it's one of, it's a step rather than going into all-out war. He does tell the generals, if a U-2 is shot down, I give you um, authority, you the military authority, to go in and wipe out that surface to air missile site that does the shooting. And uh, he's got the military at full alert, one step away from war, and he goes on television and, and tells the nation. You could, you could pull up his speech to the nation on YouTube and see that he does it in a very grave manner, but he's kind of steady and level-headed so that people didn't panic, although I would hear from people that, boy, you know, who remember this, say the anxiety level was through the roof. I remember one woman saying, oh, my father went out in the yard and started to dig the bomb shelter right after the, the president spoke. And another woman had a really odd story. She said, so I went to school the next morning. I was just a little girl. And at the end, the teacher goes, the end of the day, the teacher goes, there will be no homework tonight because there may not be a tomorrow. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that to a little kid? And, you know, she couldn't fully comprehend it, but the teacher could. And the teacher's fears were well-founded because the Russians said back to the U.S. about the blockade, it's illegal and you've just put us on the path to nuclear war. So now... Uh, Kennedy's given authorizations for the U-2s to be assisted by low-flying aircraft to get even more photos of where the various military sites are if we do an invasion of Cuba. And, and this was a Navy crusader that did a great job of capturing photos. Very different than the U-2. This would be going 500 miles per hour at treetop level um, so fast that the uh, Cubans who were putting up small arms fire you know, could never uh, hit it, but they got some incredibly clear photos. You see one here going at that speed. So in this photo, the missile is housed in that big tent in the center of the screen. And off the screen would be a trapezoidal configuration of surface to air missiles to protect the nuclear missile. And our pilots knew our U-2 pilots knew they were sitting ducks for these uh, service to air missiles. There's no weapons on board a U-2. Um, it's not like a super maneuverable aircraft. In fact, they were very temperamental and most people who went to the U-2 uh, training with the CIA washed out because it was just such a difficult plane to fly. No two flew the exact same. They were made from jig pieces put together, so each one was a little different. And um, you're always flying alone, so you're out of radio contact for six or seven hours at a time alone, way up in the stratosphere. 
We had uh, Adlai Stevenson address the UN and the world, you know, giving our reasons for the blockade, and he trot out the supporting photographs. Kind of reminded me of Colin Powell with the misinformation that we had during the second Iraq war. But in this case, in 1962, almost all the intelligence turned out to be correct about the warheads in Cuba. The one big piece of intelligence that we missed was we never realized that the Soviets had tactical or, or battlefield nuclear weapons, if you will, that if we had done a D-Day style invasion would have wiped out thousands and thousands of, of soldiers. So, so we were never aware of that till it was all over. So now it's Jerry's turn to fly. Again, we're probably maybe, let's see, 10, 10 days into the crisis. And um, he's told, you're gonna do a long overflight of Cuba. You're gonna uh, shoot four targets with your photos. And off he goes, and on the ground, without authority from Khrushchev, uh, someone, we'll never know for sure who in this case, gives the authorization to shoot at Jerry. Now, whether they're shooting to take him down or warning shots, we'll never know. And I said to Jerry, well, what happened? And he said, "I, in my rear view mirror, and I said, what, you've got a rear view mirror and a U2? And he said, yes, yes. Uh, he said, in my rear view mirror, I could see a contrail coming up to me. And the way he explained it is he said, then there was this starburst in the sky. So he knew the surface air missile had exploded. He said, it was quite a distance behind and above me. I said, what'd you do next? He said, I did what I'm trained to do. I took pictures. And he said, a second one burst. And he said, then I got the hell out of there. And so when he lands, he's debriefed by the CIA and the Air Force. He tells them what happened. He then tells his fellow pilots, hey, they, they fired on me and I got it on film. The film was taken to Washington, D.C. to be developed. And um, by the way, I asked Jerry, is this what it looked like? And he said, no. He said, this is what it would first look like when the SAM exploded. But he said, then all the shrapnel would go in different directions, making it kind of look like this starburst. But the, the odd thing to this story, and, and this is how I opened up the book above and beyond, because I always like to open it up with a fast paced scene. You know, Jerry's just landed, he's just been shot at, uh, he's lucky to be alive. Uh, the next morning he's walking off to his aircraft and he hears somebody shout his last name uh, McElmoyle and Jerry turns around. Yes, sir. And he can't believe it. It's a three star general, somebody he's never seen before. And the general goes, I've just flown down from Washington, D.C. We have analyzed your film and there was nothing on it. And Jerry goes, sir, I'm positive. I got those starbursts on the contrails. And the general goes, you did not. There was nothing on your film, so we destroyed your film and we destroyed your intelligence briefing because you're mistaken. And Jerry goes, sir, I'm positive. And finally, the general goes, do you understand what I'm telling you? In other words, zip it up. Um, we'll never know who authorized this or why, but independently, Jerry and I came to a very similar conclusion. We both thought somebody at high level, I thought in the military, Jerry thought one of the president's advisors decided not to tell Kennedy because they feared Kennedy would stop the U-2 overflights before we had accumulated all the intelligence we needed. So from a military standpoint, they need this information. They don't want to stop the U-2 overflights. But from a political standpoint, Kennedy probably would have said, okay, that's it. They're shooting no more U-2 overflights. We can't have another Gary Powers situation where the Russians parade around one of our pilots. So it never got to Kennedy because I went through every single one of those transcripts of all the many meetings and this never, never came up. You'll read in the book how Jerry later confirmed what happened because he went on to become a, a brigadier general and um, 
was involved with Strategic Air Command and our nuclear missiles during the Reagan administration and had meetings with President Reagan and uh, the CIA back then. And he was able to do a little research back on the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we've now kind of hit the, the climax of the story. We're into day 13. And it was a Saturday, just like today, only this one is called Black Saturday, because if you could imagine everything going wrong from miscalculations to screw ups to you name it, it's all happening on this one day. And um, I think three of these events I'm going to talk about, most people are not too aware of. I, I was only aware of one out of the three. Uh, really had to be tough for Kennedy. And, and I was um, thinking how young he was at the time, just 44 years old, uh, to have that kind of pressure on you um, and to withstand all the advice you're getting. Uh, you need to take military action right away. And he kept hesitating. But um, one of the, the big problems, and this could have become Armageddon, really, when you think about it, was the Soviet sub B-59. They were approaching the quarantine line, and we had told the Russians, if we locate one of your subs, we're going to drop practice depth charges around it. That means we found you. You need to surface and turn back. Now, whether that information got to the commander of B-59, we don't know, but so many depth charges were dropped. He thought they were live. And uh, later there was an interview with the crew from this Russian sub and they said it felt like we were in a metal drum and somebody was taking a sledgehammer to it. And so finally, this commander of the sub who thinks that World War III has broken out says to the first officer, prepare the special torpedo. And I didn't know what special torpedo meant until I realized it was a torpedo with a nuclear tip. And they've actually loaded it into firing tube number three, and he's getting ready to fire it to vaporize the aircraft carrier there. And this is just luck. On the same sub is the flotilla coordinator of equal command, but does not have control of the sub. And he says, no, 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 we have no authorization from Moscow to launch the special torpedo. And they get in this argument, and thank God, the flotilla coordinator is able to convince the commander not to fire that nuclear torpedo. Uh, that would have certainly triggered nuclear war. So that's how close we came. Uh, a lucky break that the coordinator happened to be on this particular sub and not one of the other three Foxtrot style Soviet subs that was at the quarantine line. And this is that uh, flotilla coordinator, uh, Arkhipov was his last name. And um, so while people give a lot of credit for Kennedy for defusing the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, this, this gentleman deserves a lot of the credit. He later died from um, exposure during a, a sub accident that he was on, a nuclear sub accident exposed to radiation. And, We'll never know just how many accidents there are on uh, submarines. Earlier, I introduced you to Chuck Mosby. He was the one held by the Chinese during the Korean War. And I'm reading about his involvement. I'm like, wait a minute, he's up in Alaska. He's got nothing to do with the Cuban Missile Crisis. But you'll see it plays a role. He's a YouTube pilot, and he's told fly over the North Pole and get radioactive samplings. This is kind of routine for us to do to monitor what the Soviets are doing with their nuclear arsenal. That's the routine part, but the flight over the North Pole is anything but routine because it's gonna be seven hours alone at night, uh, overfly the North Pole, then come back and land in Alaska. And you're gonna do this by celestial navigation because there is no GPS and really there's no land masses to look down at or over the polar ice fields. And so Chuck takes off and they had planned for all contingencies. 
except one, <laughs> and that was the the Northern Lights, which he was basically blinded by. And Chuck said, I figured they'd go away in five minutes, but they stayed out. And so now I couldn't take my celestial fixes and I became disoriented. There was no radio contact. I was so far off. He said, uh, I, I tried to head back towards Alaska as best I could, but he was woefully off, off course. And um, you see in this slide, he left from Ison Air Force Base. His last um, radio contact was over Barter Island. Then he's heading towards the North Pole, and that's where the Northern Lights come out. And so on his return trip, he strayed far to the west. And it was kind of funny the way he said that he realized he was over Russian airspace. He said, I was fiddling with the frequencies on my radio when I picked up Russian music. <laughs> and that's never a good thing. And uh, the Russians knew he had come into their airspace. They didn't know it was a U-2. They just knew it was a foreign aircraft. So they're thinking this might be the start of a, of a United States attack on the motherland. Let's send up four jets and shoot this down. Now, normally four MiGs couldn't reach a U-2, but Chuck has looked at his fuel gauge and seen that it's close to empty. And he has to make a decision. And part of his decision is, I am not going to be taking POW. I want to have enough fuel to make an emergency landing. And, and so he decides to shut down all power to the aircraft, which means that his pressure suit better work. And he's thinking, I'm going to glide towards the east now that he has an idea. He's too far to the west. And this is the one part of the program that I kind of want to leave as a cliffhanger because it's a big part of the book and I want it to be a surprise what happens. And it's it's almost like, you know, like a, from a James Bond movie. There's so many odd things that occur and uh, you see it from Chuck's perspective. You see it from the Russian perspective. You see it from our strategic air command who knows what's happening over the skies and um, it, it could have started nuclear war very easily, uh, but for some lucky breaks again. Um, but I'll leave that as the as a surprise. Now, ironically, at the very same moment that Chuck is in trouble, Major Rudy Anderson launches from Orlando to fly over Cuba in his U-2. And um, Rudy actually volunteered for the mission. He wanted to be known as the pilot who did the most overflights over Cuba during the crisis. So uh, off he went on Saturday morning. And on the ground, the Russians, of course, could pick him up by the radar. And again, their MiGs couldn't fly that high, but their surface air missiles could. The two Russian generals who are watching this on radar say, the first one goes, our guest has overstayed his welcome. And the second one goes, let's get permission to, to shoot him down. And they try to contact the Supreme Commander of Soviet Forces in Cuba. They can't reach him. It turned out he was, he was really sick. And so they decide, well, all our information coming in is that the Americans are going to attack in the next 24 hours, which was accurate. We were getting ready. They decide that gives them the authorization to take down this aircraft flying over sensitive, uh, sensitive site near um, near a little town in Cuba called Banyes, which isn't very far from Guantanamo Bay. I don't know this for sure, but I think the reason that particular site is sensitive is uh, I do know there were tactical nuclear weapons by the Russians. Uh, ready to rain down on, on Gitmo. And so they give the authorization to the surface air missile site at Banyes, destroy target number 33, which is Major Rudy Anderson. So Rudy comes in over Havana, goes right down the center of the island. He's near Guantanamo Bay uh, when they fire. And a little bit of speculation on my part, what happened next. I 
am pretty certain that it wasn't a direct hit, but the U-2 was wounded because I immediately called up Jerry McElmoyle and I said, Jerry, if a U-2 is hit by a, a surface air missile, you know, it would disintegrate. And, uh, and he said, correct. But he said, if the surface air missile explodes nearby, all it takes is one piece of shrapnel and it can bring down a U-2 because it's such a flimsy aircraft. And then I found probably the best slide in the whole presentation. I'm going to show you what Major Anderson's aircraft looked like on the ground. This was taken by a Cuban. Um, there's actually video to go along with this. And uh, Rudy's body was still inside the cockpit. So I called Jerry and I go, why isn't it, you know, if it's 13 miles up, it should be in pieces. And this, this shows the fuselage intact. And Jerry said it, it was wounded. He said, what happens is it starts to come down like a leaf from a tree is the way he described it, like spiraling down. You're going to lose one wing, then you're going to lose the other, then the tail. And he said, uh, you know, we later got Major Anderson's body back to the U.S. And we found that a tiny piece of shrapnel had pierced his pressure suit. So our speculation is that he never had time to give out a May Day. He never had time to try and eject. You know, there is an ejection seat with, in a parachute. Um, that everything happened so fast and he lost the air pressure. And we're well aware, we being the U.S. military, of what happened. But oddly, you'll read in the book that they don't tell Kennedy right away. They knew by noontime on Saturday that we've lost a pilot. And they don't tell Kennedy until the uh, during the middle of the afternoon briefing. It's like 4 p.m., and one of the generals kind of casually goes, yep, we lost a U-2 today. And, and Bobby Kennedy goes, what? And the general goes, yeah, we, we lost an aircraft. And Bobby goes, is the pilot dead? And the general goes, yes. And then the president goes, well, this is a whole new ball game. In other words, loss of life. They've shot one of our U-2s down. And Curtis LeMay is ready to respond like Kennedy had promised. They shoot down a U-2. Kennedy said, we're going to go in and wipe out their surface air missile sites. But Kennedy goes, no, not yet. And LeMay is furious. Uh, when he leaves the meeting, he goes to one of his aides. I can't believe the president has chickened out again. We've lost one of our pilots and he still won't do anything. But what Kennedy did was he pulls Bobby aside privately and he goes, Bobby, go to the foreign foreign Soviet minister and basically give him this, this last chance. He never used the word ultimatum, but that's what it was. He said, uh, you know, we're preparing for military action. Here's our last offer. And the deal has to be this. You, the Russians, remove all your uh, missiles out of Cuba. We will promise not to invade the island in turn. And at a later date, we'll remove our missiles from Turkey. But that part of the agreement has to be kept mano to mano uh, out of the public eye, uh, probably because Kennedy didn't want to appear to be giving up too much. And he couldn't even promise Castro, excuse me, uh, Khrushchev, when the missiles would come out of Turkey. It took very uh, several months because it involved working with NATO. And I mentioned Castro. Castro was furious at this deal. He was ready to sacrifice all of Cuba for this mission. He wanted Khrushchev to use the nuclear missiles. But uh, Khrushchev, uh, his son told me, jumped at the deal and said, absolutely, I accept. And I said, why did your father agree so readily? And he said, because what he feared was happening. Everything was spinning out of control. You have the Chuck Maltzby situation over Russia. You have Rudy Anderson being shot down without Khrushchev's um, authorization. You have B-59, the sub. Uh, so things are heading towards war without these two leaders uh, being in total control. So this is their last chance to stop it. And thank God they both agree to the deal. 
Curtis was not too happy, and um, Kennedy told everybody involved, he said, we've achieved our mission. We wanted the missiles out of Cuba without major loss of life. They've lost uh, Rudy Anderson. Um, it was very interesting. I never knew about Rudy Anderson's death, so I looked at a lot of newspapers from October, the day after, October 15th, and it, was, it wasn't covered up. It, it was mentioned in a couple newspapers, but it only got like a paragraph or two. The biggest, bigger issue was, you know, nuclear war avoidance. So the loss of Rudy Anderson kind of became a footnote to history, and so few people even know his name. So Kennedy uh, told the nation about the deal, leaving out the part about the, our missiles in Turkey to be removed. Uh, Rudy Anderson, uh, his body was returned. You read in the book how hard it was on his wife. Um, ironically, a year before he died, the Air Force messed up and uh, a pilot was killed in a training accident and they went to inform the pilot's wife they went to the wrong house. They go to Rudy's house. His wife answers the door and they go, we regret to inform you, your husband's died in a training accident and he was fine. So now when he really is killed, they go to the house and they knock on the door and they say the same thing and she doesn't know what to believe. And so in the book, we talk about what it was like from her perspective and it wasn't, it wasn't easy. She was pregnant at the time, uh, two young kids, uh, being asked to leave the military base because once once your husband is no longer an active member of the Air Force, you have to leave the base. So it was just an awful situation. Kennedy, I close with a really neat story. I think uh, Kennedy was classy. He took time out from his busy schedule, flew down to Florida to thank all the pilots in person. And so Jerry said, uh, I was so excited I was going to get to meet the president. And he goes, right at the last hour, they tell me, no, you're the rookie. You got to stay back in the hangar with the U-2 in case somebody from the president's entourage, you know, wants to see what a U-2 looked like. Because they're, they're, at that point, they were still a super secret aircraft. And Jerry said, uh, so imagine I'm in the, in the hangar at the U-2 up, up the steps at the cockpit. And in rolls Kennedy's limousine. And he said, the president gets out. And he said, I could hear him as plain as day. And he says uh, to his entourage, he says, you stay in the limousine. I'm going to go up the steps. I want to talk to that young man in private. And so I closed the book with this really fascinating conversation between Kennedy and Jerry, just the two of them, two people that had seen combat talking right at the cockpit of the U-2. And so because Jerry was so helpful, uh, I dedicated the book to him and to the other pilots. And so if you're interested in the book, I have them at a uh, discounted price on my website. And so if you're interested for a Father's Day gift or a gift, uh, you can order through the website and tell me how you want to personalize it through that website. Uh, the last name spelling is always the, the tricky part. But I wanted to show you two last slides. There's Jerry today. Looks like he could be my father. Uh, so I know what I'm going to look like when I lose the rest of my hair. And all those U-2 pilots who flew knowing they could be shot down at any moment. And in particular, Major Rudy Anderson, the only casualty of the war. And Bonda, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, or if anybody wants to uh, send a question, you can do it through the chat, and together we'll be looking for those. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Really appreciate that. So everyone, you can um, get the uh, books at michaeltugas.com, and we're now open it for questions and answers uh, on the uh, right hand side of your screen at the very bottom. You can see kind of grayed out. It says type your message. So anyone having questions, please um, type your message in there. 
Okay, I see a couple of people are typing now. I see Thank a you, Annette. Okay, here's one. Uh, it says, did the wreckage of the U-2 get returned to the USA? That is a great question, and, I, and uh, I'm so glad you asked it because I didn't bring that up. No, and if you were to go to Cuba today in two different spots, you'd be able to see parts of the wreckage. In fact, in front of the Museum of the Revolution in Cuba is uh, uh, parts of the engine. And there, there's a little plaque underneath it. And they don't say who shot it down. A lot of times the Cubans try to take credit, but they never had uh, control of the surface to air missiles. Uh, we have someone who is in the blockade. That must have been unreal to see so many ships surrounding that one island. I had someone say to me who was in the blockade said, you looked out and it was just wall to wall ships uh, just off the coast of Cuba and then at the blockade line, which was 500 miles out. That's great that we have someone who participated. There's another question. Yes, I see it. Uh, when were the intelligence reports released? Did you make use of them? Yes, they were released over a period of years. I, it seemed like uh, the best source for me was at uh, George Washington University. So if you were interested in some, if you were to Google George Washington University, Cuban Missile Documents, I think you would be able to find some of them there. Um, many people wrote about this who were eyewitnesses as well. Bobby Kennedy wrote a book about it. Um, uh, he was assassinated before it was finished, but one of his close AIDS finished the books up, and um, that was a valuable source for us as well. So wherever we could get eyewitness, you know, firsthand accounts. Uh, we have someone uh, who was at Patrick Air Force Base. Looks like we're missing part of that uh, yeah. message, uh, Steve, if you want to type the rest of it for us. While we're waiting on that, um, I do want to thank everyone for giving it a go on this um, first virtual presentation. I appreciate those uh, completing the survey and would ask others to do that as well. Uh, now I see a picture of the U2. Did you see that question, Michael? Yes, and um, uh, I'm not, it may have come from the Sorensen's collection, um, one of Kennedy's advisors why his name was on a photo. And also that question, I think the other guy just blinked. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was McNamara uh, that said that. I I, I kind of disagree with that quote. It's not like the other guy just blinked. It was, we came to an agreement with the Russians and we both were level-headed enough to pull away from the, the abyss. So I give part of the credit to uh, to Khrushchev as well, that um, he knew things were out of control. Had had Castro been in charge, uh, the world would be very different right now. We would have been in nuclear war. Uh, there's a the rest of it. Uh, Bo uh, was Bobby Lynn involved? He asked. I did not come across that name, so I don't think he was one of the ten U two pilots who who flew. Uh, those were the, the, the 10 names I became familiar with. And, you know, one thing I learned from writing books, and I read so much, I try to read a book a week. Um, if there's too many characters, it I get lost. So I always like to have, for whatever book, even if it's one of these survival and rescue at sea books, like A Storm Too Soon, which is my personal favorite, uh, I distill it down so you really get to know just five or six characters, too many. And I think the reader loses track. And with five or six, you get to know them as people and that way you get to care about them. So you're you're interested in the, the outcome. I'm currently writing a, a book about what I've learned from interviewing, you know, probably in the past 25 years, I've probably interviewed a hundred people that shouldn't be on the planet, the most remarkable survivors, mostly survivors at sea, but others as well. 
from other uh, ordeals they've been through and, and what we can all learn from them. So it's this painstaking project because my way of research is the old fashioned way, print everything. So for every book I have, I usually have two boxes, you know, about two feet long, filled with files and files and everything's organized in the file. And then when it comes time to write the book, you feel overwhelmed. And what I've learned from these survivors is the way to tackle it is little steps. Don't think about the big project or you'll give up. Just look at it chapter by chapter. And I look at each chapter as kind of like a mini book. And that way, somehow you put one chapter together and next thing you know, you've got half a book that you're ready to, to pitch. So let's see, I've got another question. Um, one of the picture, I see, he was one of the picture takers. Do you happen to know how the Cuban people were received in the US during the crisis? Um, I don't really know, but you know, it's interesting today. I have a one of my best buddies, he just married a, a, a Cuban woman and finally got her moved to the United States. So he's been spending a ton of time in Cuba before this pandemic. And um, he says that the Cuban people are, are incredibly uh, friendly towards him. Um, they they would love to see things open up more. And um, it, it's I think this again, I'm just giving a personal opinion. I think if things were opened up more and travel was opened up more between the two countries, uh, some of the tensions would go away and maybe the seed of democracy might might take root in Cuba. But um, right now that's all off the table with the quarantine, Cuba's gonna struggle with it just like everybody else. I think that was it. We had a, a thank you from Susan and, and Bonda. I just wanna thank Bonda while everybody's listening. Uh, this is a lot of work to put together these <laughs> online programs. We, uh, the two of us were learning as we went. So I'm just so pleased that Bonda figured it out and helped me through and that uh, we pulled it off and had this nice morning together. Well, thank you, Michael. It was definitely teamwork. And I want to thank everyone who's, who's uh, listened to the presentation. I would suggest to everyone for the, uh, if you sign up for the next ones, there's two more. They're on our website, uh, ormanhistory.org, and you can register for those. Um, try logging on about five minutes ahead of time. I'll have the um, room open about 10 minutes before. And that way we can, um, if you can't hear or see, we can try to work through your issues before the presentation starts. So uh, again, Michael, it was great teamwork. It was fun working with you and it was a wonderful presentation. I'm so glad that we were able to deliver it. Thank everyone for uh, listening and participating. And I see about 82% of you have voted or have um, done the survey. So that's great. I appreciate that. And um, until next time, which will be June the 13th, same time Saturday morning as our normal lectures, but it'll be on the 13th. Mm -hmm. And that one's on privateers of the Americas. So that's going to be a fun one as well. Michael, again, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who's participating. And thank you to the audience and the Florida Humanities that helped Bond and I. Have a great Saturday. It's not Black Saturday. It's a good day. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Right. Thank you all.